Hi everyone. Today I'm going to discuss another retrosynthesis with particular emphasis on picking the order of steps that you have to do as it can make some real differences in this molecule on the screen. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel for more content like this. All right then, to get started, I'm just going to make a list of the functional groups that I have. I have an acetal here on the right, an alkyne in the middle, an amide over on the left-hand side, and the amide is part of a seven-membered ring, so I'm going to keep track of that feature as well. And right here in the middle of the molecule, there's a branch point on a ring. And because branch points are often good places to disconnect, and that that's in the middle of the molecule, that might be potentially very useful to us. Now, the perhaps slightly unusual feature of this molecule is the seven-membered ring. I'm just separating it out here so that we can have a think about the synthesis. Now, for making amides, we'll, we'd usually break the CN bond here. I've just stripped aside some of the functional groups so we can focus in on the ring to give me an amine and something with a carbonyl with a leaving group on it. I'm just going to leave it as X. Now we actually have a slight problem here because it's known that ring closures of seven membered rings are quite tricky. There's a combination of factors that account for this. The seven membered ring itself will have a little bit of transannular strain. So unlike a six membered ring, most of the carbons here won't be able to sit in a perfectly staggered conformation. Transannular also means that you're likely to get clash across the ring because it can't sit in, say, a perfect chair-like conformation. Furthermore, there's a lot more rotational freedom around these bonds in this open chain form, and that means it's less likely to be in the reactive conformation for forming the ring in the first place. This is a factor that becomes important when you try to consider forming big rings, and they're just not very favorable. So if the total number of conformations at that molecule starts to increase a lot with a longer chain, the chances of being in the reactive conformation become smaller and smaller. So this is like an entropy effect. In fact, it becomes a lot more likely at this point that the nitrogen from another molecule will just attack instead, and you could form a polymer. Not ideal. So this CN disconnection isn't looking so good here, but fortunately there's another option for us. We can do a ring expansion reaction to form amides like this, and that will disconnect me back to, well, the ketone and hydroxylamine. Now, it might not be totally obvious what's going on here, so I'll just explain how this works. And I'm going to be using what's known as the Beckman rearrangement to solve this problem. If I take my ketone and treat it with hydroxylamine in the presence of catalytic acid, I'll first be able to activate the electrophile and attack in to give myself this tetrahedral intermediate. Swapping around some protons, I can make water a leaving group and kick it out by an E1 type elimination. Just losing another proton along the way, I'll end up with this structure. And this new functional group might look a bit weird. It's called an oxime. And at this point, I want to make that OH a better leaving group. So I'm going to boil it up in acid. And now we have a very, very weak NO bond in here. And it's locked antiperiplanar to this CC bond here. Now that means that the molecular orbitals are always overlapped with each other. Specifically, the CC sigma bond is overlapped with the sigma star of the NO bond, and the rearrangement can occur in these circumstances. So with a little bit more activation energy, the pair of electrons from this bond can migrate over to kick out the water to give me the seven-membered ring. So this migration is intramolecular, so we have no diffusion limit, and also there's an entropy driving force for it in that we're going from one molecule to two. Once we form the slightly strange carbocation, the water molecule can then come in, and after a few proton transfers, we'll end up with the amide product. Specifically, that's the one with the star here that we were considering right at the top. Okay, so re returning to the main molecule we're thinking about, we identified that that branch point in the middle might be really useful for us. So I'm first going to consider the disconnection where we just cut at the branch point. That chops the molecule into two halves seems to be a good place to go. Now, alkynes, when they're deprotonated, make really good nucleophiles. So for the left-hand side, I need an acceptor synthon, and specifically a 1,3. Really good A3 synthons are alpha-beta and saturated carbonyl compounds. So perhaps I could use something like this one, with the intention of using a deprotonated alkyne as the nucleophile. So something like this. I need to make sure it was soft, but that's OK. After I've added my base, I could use the cuprate, as in I could treat the anion with a copper 1 salt to make it behave like a soft nucleophile. Now, this is where we start to run into some problems. If I try to do a Beckman rearrangement now, well, it would take me back to 
this alpha, beta unsaturated carbonyl compound with an ethyl group dangling off the left hand side. And we're a bit stuck because, in fact, if we try to do the Beckman rearrangement on here with hydroxylamine, there's actually quite a big risk that it will do conjugate addition instead and give us a completely different product that we don't want rather than form the oxime. Now, we might be able to force the conditions somehow, but it's never a good idea to set up competitive reactions when you're doing retrosynthesis. So I've hit a dead end already here. So I mustn't have that double bond in there when I'm trying to do the Beckman rearrangement. Now, I could try and install it later by oxidation. And there are ways of doing that, say, using a sulfoxide elimination or maybe a Sagusa oxidation. But we are really making things a lot harder for ourselves when we're just trying to make quite a straightforward molecule here. And I think the decision we need to revise is trying to do this particular addition where we cut straight in the middle of the molecule. I think we're going to have to save the Beckman rearrangement for much later where we don't have the risk of these side reactions. So I'm going to revise my first disconnection to being the Beckman step first. So if my final step in the synthesis is going to be a Beckman rearrangement, I'm going to need this ketone with an ethyl group on the left hand side and the alkyne already on. So I'll move forwards thinking about that molecule specifically. Now, whenever you're considering a migration type reaction in a synthesis, we really should just check that everything is lined up correctly. So the proposal for the final step in the synthesis would be to mix it up with hydroxylamine, with catalytic acid to form the oxime. And then what we're going to do is boil it up in acid to promote the migration and formation of the amide. And I think this is going to work out for us. There's actually a key factor here in forming the oxime. There are two different isomers of the oxime that could form, one with the hydroxyl group on the left-hand side like this, or one with the hydroxyl group on the right-hand side. Now, it turns out that this stereoisomer is preferred for this setup, and that's largely because the oxime formation was reversible and under thermodynamic control. And that just means that the steric bulk over this side with that ethyl group is helping keeping that OH exactly where we need it to be. So then we have the correct bonds antiperiplanar for the migration. If we don't have that control, the nitrogen will end up on the wrong side of the carbonyl in the final product. Okay, so we're almost there for a complete synthesis route. But one thing to watch out for here is that acetal will not be happy with being boiled in acid here. It will just fall off. But that's okay, we can just make the hydroxylamine leave in a different way. Rather than using aqueous acid, we could just use tozal chloride instead. The Beckman rearrangement will work in the same way, we're just making the OH a leaving group in a different way. So essentially we're all good now, let's plow on with the retrosynthesis. I definitely want to try and split this molecule into two to really simplify the problem, so I'm going to take the alkyne addition next. That will take me back to these components. So as we said before, we just need to make the cuprate. We could do that by, say, taking the alkyne and treating it with a strong base. Commonly, things that get used here would be, e.g., butyl lithium, and we'd be very careful to use one equivalent here. So one equivalent, the butyl lithium, will take the one proton on the end. The butane generated will disappear out of the flask and leave us with the lithium salt. And then before we add it to the alpha beta unsaturated ketone, we make sure it's found some copper one to make it behave like a soft nucleophile, and then we add the alpha beta unsaturated ketone. Now, this alpha beta unsaturated ketone can quite easily be disconnected at its own branch point on the left hand side to take that ethyl group off. That will take me back to cyclohexanone and ethyl bromide. And to go backwards, we can just use enolate chemistry. Now, of course, there's two places that this one can be enolized. There's this one on the alpha prime site, or there's this one in the gamma site. So we want to select this one at the top here. Now, luckily, our old friend LDA can be used here. And that's because if I take this ketone, LDA tends to coordinate to oxygen lone pairs on ketones, and it will direct the base specifically to the one that's nearby via a six-membered ring transition state. So at minus 78 degrees, we'll form this lithium enolate, which specifically will react at the alpha prime site here. So all is good. Now, as far as that side of the molecule is concerned, I'm going to stop because ethyl bromide and cyclohexenone are pretty cheap and readily available as well. Now, just a quick disconnection to finish off the other components, which is an acetal. It has a branch point in the middle here on a ring. So when we disconnect acetals, we're doing a 1-1 difunctionalized compound, and we don't really want to open up that ring and give ourselves a more complicated problem. So I'm just going to disconnect here. That will take me back to propargyl alcohol, which is readily available. Now, I just want to have a think about what we could use as the other component. 
The obvious one to go for is perhaps the chloride in that position. So we're just doing some sort of substitution reaction. And so here it would be really good for SN1. And that's all fine. We could do that. But there is a valid alternative reaction here that might be easier to deal with in the lab. And that would be to use this molecule here, which is very cheap and readily available. This is dihydropyran, often just called by its initials DHP. Now, the reason why this works in a reaction like this is if I were to treat this with just catalytic acid, well, it's an enol ether, so if it will find the H+, we'll generate the oxycarbenium ion, and then our alcohol could just come in like this. And after a proton transfer, we'll get our acetal. So the reason why I mention this is that this is a very cheap, but also very old school protecting group for an alcohol. Now, the reason that it's very old school and why it's not my favorite is that nowadays in the lab, you would use NMR spectroscopy a lot. And what we might not have noticed in the synthesis of this acetal is that we actually generate a stereocenter here, which on paper looks quite innocent, but it's going to really mess with your NMR spectrum. So the preferred conformation of that molecule will be like this, with the OR group in the axial position due to the anomeric effect. This is going to add so many peaks to your NMR spectrum if you're going to use this as a protecting group to the point that it becomes unhelpful. So for example, every single one of these protons are now different. So your NMR spectra will have a whole load of extra peaks, all of which are not simple, particularly the ones on the right-hand side of that molecule. And it's just a lot more brief than just using a silyl ether for your synthesis. For reference, this protecting group is often known as the tetrahydropyran protecting group, or THP. If you enjoyed this discussion, please do give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel. It really gives me some helpful feedback for planning my future videos. A few of my other videos on related topics to this one are on the screen now.